Dry Tortugas National Park is located 70 miles off the coast of Florida in the city of Key West. The park is accessible via a long ferry ride or a seaplane and it's one of the most incredible national parks in the country. The park sees less than 50,000 visitors a year, making it one of the least visited national parks, but a visit to Dry Tortugas is well worth the effort. The park preserves Fort Jefferson, a historic fort from the 1800s that pretty much takes up the entire island. My dad and I took the ferry over for a full day on the island in November of 2021 and here is all the information on this national park. Let me know what you think and if you have any questions in the comments and let's jump into it. This is the last morning of our trip and we're walking over to the harbor to get on the ferry to go to Dry Tortugas National Park. We stayed in a hotel that was only about a 15 minute walk away but if you need to park you can park at one of these structures down here. It is around $32 for the day though if you have to park in them. And then that's where we're going. Key West Ferry Terminal, we are going out on the Yankee Freedom. They recommend that you get there at least 30 minutes before boarding, so that's what we did and we got checked in and then just waited for our time to get on the boat. The boat wasn't running at full capacity and there was a lot of indoor and outdoor seating while you waited. Pops made a Cuban Coffee Queen run. It's good stuff. Prepare for the bumpy ride. Sandwich. There were four parties on the standby list trying to get on the boat and unfortunately none of them got on, so definitely book a ticket in advance if you're able to. You wouldn't want to come all the way out to Key West and not be able to get on the boat. The normal boat that they used for this was in the shop, so this was a similar boat, but if you go it might be a little bit different. When you board they give you breakfast and then they actually give you lunch when you get to the island as well. There was a lot of seating both inside and outside, but we opted to sit outside. Also, there's a cafe if you want to buy additional drinks or snacks while on the boat, and they gave us some papers to read about the history of Dry Tortugas if you're interested. The boat left promptly at 8, and we slowly made our way out of the harbor. It was pretty cool to get a view of Mallory Square and some of the other popular spots of Key West from here as well. Click the link in the description if you want to learn about some of my favorite spots in Key West. As the ship hits the open ocean, you'll begin the two and a half hour ride to Dry Tortugas. Honestly, it's relatively uneventful. I was hoping that we'd be able to see more stuff, but it's basically just open ocean for most of the trip. Every once in a while, you'll see a small island, but that's about it. There was coffee available inside and some books you could read, plus things you could purchase if you wanted a souvenir from the park. The last 45 minutes on the way to the island was pretty bumpy and people who were prone to seasick were having a rough time. That being said, the crew was amazing and they were ready to help out if needed. Eventually the island came into view and it was crazy as it just came out of nowhere. We basically had nothing on the horizon for the entire trip and then the island suddenly popped into view. Our approach took us around the back side of the island first before docking on the south side. As we were docking, two seaplanes landed behind us. This would honestly be an amazing way to get to the island as it only took about 45 minutes instead of two and a half hours, but it was also double the price, which is why we did the ferry. We arrived at the fort at around 10.30 and we had until three o'clock to explore. There was a tour that you could go on or you could just explore everything on your own. We opted to just explore on our own and we headed into the fort first. We made it to Dry Tortugas National Park. And Pops is wearing five finger shoes. We just got to the park, it's 10.30. We have until 2.45 here. So there's tours you can take or you can just explore on your own and then go snorkel, which I think is what we're gonna do. When you originally board the boat, they give you a link to a PDF that gives you tons of history on the island. You can take this and the map with you when you're exploring, which help you to understand what you're looking at. So all these little rooms right here are known as casemates, and this is where they put the cannons. If they were going to shoot out, there's all along the entire downstairs, and I think some of the other 
floors, they have these. A lot of the history talks about how horrible this place was for the prisoners and for the guards as well, as there was not a lot of food and it could get really lonely out on the island. This is Dr. Mud's cell. He was the most famous prisoner that they had when this was a prison. Dr. Mudd was part of the group that assassinated Lincoln, and he was the one who set John Wilkes Booth's leg. This was his cell that he lived in while he was a prisoner here, and there's lots of information known about the island because he wrote many letters back home while he was here. He was eventually pardoned because of his help with the yellow fever epidemic that happened in the fort. Pops was noting that this is just a gigantic cell, but it said that this was never designed to be a prison, so that's why so big. So this is interesting too, I'm assuming this is just salt from the salt water that's seeped in and dry as you can see all around. Salt everywhere. So the rangers still live on the island, so this is the ranger's house. After exploring the cell, we went up the spiral staircase to the top of the fort. Wow, this view is epic. Oh man, that's incredible. There's an example of one of the massive cannons they have at the fort. How often do you ever see this in a national park? Look at this trail, nothing protecting you from the edge. Pretty awesome. And they keep saying that your safety is your responsibility. As it should be. As we got to the upper part of the fort, we were blown away by the amazing views that we had. It was super windy, so we didn't get too close to the edge, but the views were incredible from up here. This is one of the coolest views, looking down over the entrance and the moat. See the lighthouse out there, and there's the boat we came in on. There's a piece of coral right there. They said the coral was actually used to make the mortar. <laughs> Crazy coral up here. Yeah. I have to say this is easily one of the most unique national parks I've ever been to. Incredible. Fort Jefferson is actually an unfinished fort that was made with over 16 million bricks. It's the largest masonry structure in the Western Hemisphere. The iron lighthouse you see here isn't the original one. It was built in 1877 as they thought it would survive a blast better. On the site where the fort now stands, there originally was a lighthouse and a house for the lighthouse keeper. This was built in 1826 and it helped boats to navigate the surrounding reefs. The area was picked for a fort because it was close to both Cuba and Key West, Florida and it was a central area that ships would go through in the Gulf. This place is incredible. The man-made moat that surrounds the fort is one of the coolest things I've taken photos of in the last few years. It was so unique to see the way it split the two different colors of water. A track where they can roll the cannons right here. Oh, look at how it pops and how massive this cannon is. These cannons are known as 15 inch Rodmans and they could shoot a 432 pound projectile over three miles. They were left behind because of their immense size. All right, we are making our way back down to the second level. This area is known as the chapel. And it's one of the only areas that's a little bit different in the way it's laid out. So there's where you can hold your church service. As we explored the inner part of the fort, it's a lot more of the same with the big brick arches that lead to these amazing window views. The fort was built to hold over 300 cannons, but when it closed, there was only 141 here. You can see that because of the drips, it's actually forming like a cave formation. It's like a little stalactite and the start of a stalagmite right here. 
After I left this area, there was actually a plaque about cave formations that said that the rainwater dissolves the lime and creates these formations we were seeing. So that building right there, they would load the cannonball on the top and then there'd be a fire on the bottom. It would heat the cannonball up as it was going down and they would take it out that end to use in the cannon. One of the major buildings still standing was the powder magazine storage area. This is the area where they'd store the gunpowder to keep it dry and keep it from exploding. So we are right here and that's what it would have looked like. But right now, it's just empty and cool. These are the boats that were used by the Cuban refugees. If they got stopped while they were in the water, then they had to go back. But if they got one foot on dry land, then they were able to stay. You can still see what's left of the tracks from the cannons that were in here. Not much is left, but that's what they would have used to turn them. Also, you can see that boat peeking out down the end that we just looked at. From here, we decided to walk through the center area before making our way out of the fort. There's the remains of the barracks that was never completed that you can see here. So we're standing right here, and look at this building, the barracks that would be right in front of us, and it's never completed. nothing is here. It was actually taller than the fort's walls, but a fire damaged it and it was never finished. Same with the lighthouse, it got damaged as well. So obviously there was no fresh water on this island, so they actually catch rain and keep it in a cistern. That's how they provided the island with water. There's also a visitor center on the island for a stamp and a few little trinkets. The visitor center had a small museum, a docent, and a few things to purchase, but there wasn't too much there. We're leaving Fort Jefferson and now we're going to snorkel. So the boat provides lunch, turkey or ham sandwich, got some chips, got some cookies, condiments. Sodas for a buck. Sodas for a buck, not bad. It's nice to have the lunch included and the snorkel gear is also included as well. You just pick it up when you want to use it. All right, we got our snorkel gear and we're setting out for a could be cold snorkel adventure. There's camping on this island if you're interested. I bet it'll be pretty awesome and pretty remote. Here's the reef we're going off of the south shore. We're gonna go over to there and check that out and then go along the moat. Got the snorkel gear, ready to find some fish. I've heard from quite a few people that Dry Tortugas National Park was one of the best snorkeling experiences they ever had. Unfortunately for us, it was so windy that the water was really choppy and came really murky. That being said, we still snorkeled for the better part of an hour and we saw a ton of fish, especially along the moat. Here's some clips of the fish that we saw and I have to imagine that if you go on a clear day, this is a pretty epic experience. After finishing our time snorkeling, we turned in our gear and headed out to explore the moat, which was the last part of the park that we hadn't seen yet. The moat itself was built between 1849 and 1851. However, the interior portion was dug by prisoners and it wasn't done until 1873. Unfortunately, the moats actually had some storm damage, so there are complete sections that you can't cross. If you want to see the entire moat, you have to walk to it from both sides of the fort. With about 45 minutes left before we had to get back on the ferry, this is what we did. We walked past the snorkeling beach, saw a bunch of birds, and continued around the fort to see the other section of the moat. On the way over to the other section of the moat, we saw a whole bunch of hermit crabs and a beach that was full of bricks. 
It was crazy to have a full five hours on the island and to feel like I still wanted more. All right, Pops, what do you think of Dry Tortugas? This place is freaking amazing. Oh my gosh, it's so just beautiful. But then that they have this fort in the middle of here and the history behind it with Dr. Mud and everything. It's just a fascinating place. It takes a bit to get here, but once you get here, you'll be happy that you came. It's, it's amazing. Two thumbs up? Absolutely, two thumbs up. <laughs> After walking on this section of the moat, we went back to the ferry for the two and a half hour ride back to Key West. Thanks so much for exploring Dry Tortugas National Park with us. Be sure to check this one out for yourself. Like and subscribe, and we will see you on the next video.